60 Minutes Rewind. Malta, you might say, is punching above its weight. The smallest nation in the European Union is home to one of its fastest growing economies. Name a voguish growth sector, internet gambling, cryptocurrency, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and Malta is trying to establish itself as a hub. A mere blip in the Mediterranean, Malta prides itself on this surge and its plucky personality. But as we discovered on a recent visit, there's a fine line between the cutting edge and the margins, the sun and the shadows. Along with old charms and new construction, Malta is earning a reputation for rampant corruption and dubious dealings. And then there's the matter of the assassination of a journalist, Daphne Caruana Galizia, whose revelations cut a little too close to the heart of power. Malta sits as a sun-dappled speck in the Mediterranean. Three small islands, a short ferry ride from Sicily, and not much farther to Libya, the southern gateway to Europe. It can be hard to get your bearings here. Over the last three millennia, Malta has been conquered or colonized by just about every world power, and each has left its mark. Most of the 500,000 people here are Catholic, a tradition that started early. The Apostle Paul is said to have shipwrecked here in 60 AD. I find this to be a good metaphor of Maltese culture. Really. Mark Anthony Falzone is an anthropology professor and local newspaper columnist. The story is that uh, St. Paul converted the Maltese to Christianity. So that would mean that Malta was one of the first places to be converted to Christianity, even before Rome. <laughs> so we would be the original and the best Christians. A small band of crusaders, later known as the Knights of Malta, fended off the mighty Ottomans in the 16th century. Under British rule, the Maltese survived more than 3,000 German and Italian bombing raids in World War II. Malta gained its independence in 1964. And since then, this country, with little heavy industry and not much arable land, has had to figure out a way to get by on its own. Remnants of its fabled past have made it irresistible to Hollywood producers. Parts of Gladiator were filmed here. Are you not entertained? And Game of Thrones. Europeans flock here for a budget tan. Oligarchs to dock their super yachts. Malta's already an established hub of online gambling. No more bets, good luck. But since taking over in 2013, the current government has sought to refashion the country as a mecca for emerging and complex technologies like cryptocurrency and blockchain. The 44-year-old prime minister, Joseph Muscat, is the high priest of this new gospel. Welcome to Malta, welcome to the blockchain island. Thank you. These industries may be thriving in this sunny place, yet they're known to attract more than their fair share of shadowy people. But that's nothing new. For centuries, Malta played host to pirates and smugglers, operating in what Mark Anthony Falzone calls the center of the fringes. It strikes me there's a certain ingenuity, a certain scrappiness here. Um, yes, and scrappiness also means flexibility. Does that also pertain to uh, a willingness to bend rules, a flexibility in that sense? No doubt. <laughs> um, uh, yes. The person who never bends the rules, they are thought of as a bit of a good boy. Which is not a term of endearment. No, a good boy is not a very good thing to be. Um, uh, it's naive. While we have increased... Perhaps in that same entrepreneurial spirit, the government has launched a program, some call it a scheme, to sell passports to the world's super rich. Have a spare million? You too could buy Maltese citizenship. And as this promotional video shows, the European Union passport that comes with it. As citizens of Malta, successful applicants can enjoy visa-free access to approximately 170 countries. Who's buying these passports? The Russian tycoons, Chinese tycoons, Saudi tycoons, Nigerian tycoons. For Manuel Dalia, an online journalist and longtime critic of the current government, yes, the program, one, you know, estimated to have brought in almost a billion dollars, you know, is essentially a Trojan horse, right allowing those with dubious aims to breach Europe's borders. Why would they want a Maltese passport? 
because they want to go in the rest of the world hiding where they're really from. Uh, Maltese passports give them not only free movement for themselves through European airports, but it gives their money, their capital, free movement throughout Europe. And free movement to the United States. American airport, you've got that Maltese passport validated by the EU, you go right through passport control. Visa free, absolutely. So that's a big reason to have it. Applicants to the Golden Passport Program, as it's come to be known, are supposed to show that they've established residence in Malta for at least a year. But when we checked the listed address for a Russian tycoon, it led us here. Down there in the basement. To a modest suburb and rundown basement apartment that had been divided in two. Let's just call this what it is. This, this is a fraud. It is a fraud. It's a fraud. What, what's worse is perpetrated by the state. It's not just sanctioned by the state. There are other countries in Europe where money can get you a passport, but in tiny Malta, it has helped contribute to the economic boom. And yet if Malta is suddenly flush with cash, in other ways it's bankrupt, at least according to journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia, who spent years chronicling organized crime as well as high-level corruption for Malta's major newspapers and then on her blog, Running Commentary. When she launched the site in 2008, her son Matthew says it quickly turned into a must-read. How would you describe her blog, Running Commentary, to someone that, that hadn't read it before? It was completely revolutionary. She became known simply as Daphne, and just as quickly became a reviled figure in some corners of Malta, vilified by government officials, subjected to libel suits, and to death threats. Do you ever think to say, Mom, you got to stop the blog, you've got to stop poking and provoking, this is getting dangerous. Of course she felt fear and you could see it. She knew that the powerful people that she was writing about were closing in on her. They were using every possible means to shut her down. She knew that and that frightened her deeply. Then on the afternoon of October 16th, 2017, Matthew was sitting across from his mother at the dining room table in the family home as she finished a blog post. There are crooks everywhere you look now, she wrote. The situation is desperate. Just before 3 p.m., she left the house to go to the bank. And then what seemed like 30 seconds later, I hear the explosion. And just it was just so loud. Daphne's car made it less than a mile down the road through the valley when a powerful bomb placed under her seat was detonated, sending thick black smoke into the air. Matthew ran toward the wreckage. So you think this is where I think this, this is, is where, where it, this is where the bomb went off. It's been marked by the forensic team. And this is where a lot of the flesh and metal and plastic was. The car ended up in a field 100 yards away, consumed by a fireball. Matthew's first instinct was to try and get his mother out. I remember walking up to the driver's side and just seeing fire. I didn't see anything else inside the car. There are a lot of ways to kill someone. What do you think the significance of a car bomb this powerful was? Obviously, it was a way of killing my mother, a way of sending a message to us, to our family, and a way of sending a message to anyone else who was thinking of doing anything about the really grand corruption in this country. This was a symbolic gesture. It was. The story will continue after this. For the mourners who attended Daphne's funeral, her assassination was symbolic of just how corroded Malta had become under a government that she claimed doesn't just tolerate corruption, but encourages it. The list of scandals she exposed and relentlessly pursued is too numerous to catalog here and includes allegations of cronyism, bribery, and money laundering. But there's one revelation that stands out involving a murky Maltese bank recently shuttered by European authorities. It allegedly held accounts for some of Malta's most well-connected, including the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Keith Schembri. As Daphne chronicled, Schembri is alleged to have taken kickbacks for brokering Malta's billion-dollar national energy deal and for taking payoffs to help Russian millionaires snag those coveted Maltese passports. Keith Cambry is still in business. He's the chief of staff of the prime minister. He's the most powerful man in this government. He went to work today. He went to work today. With this cloud hovering over him. Well, 
This is what impunity is about. This is why I'm angry. Shkembri denies any wrongdoing, but leaked findings into the passport kickback allegations by Malta's own financial watchdog determined that there was, quote, reasonable suspicion of money laundering and or the existence of proceeds of crime. Maltese justice officials are looking into both sets of allegations. What's more, there have been multiple inquiries by European authorities, all raising serious questions about corruption in Malta. We put all this to Glenn Bedingfield, a local so member of parliament not, and former advisor to the prime minister. What's your level of concern? I don't have any concerns. You have no concerns about corruption? No, because I think that there is a smear campaign trying to hit the government. All of this is a politically charged smear campaign? It is a politically charged smear campaign. The EU, yes. the European authorities... The EU, can, you, can you quote from an EU? I can quote from an EU report uh, right now. This is Ana Maria Gomez, an MEP. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Ana Maria Gomez. We are taking up Malta in the European Parliament. Ana Maria Gomez is a Portuguese member of the European Parliament leading an EU inquiry into the rule of law in Malta. She is part of a growing chorus of officials who see the country as a problem child on the continent. The system is basically flawed because the prime minister ultimately controls the attorney general, who also controls the police. Nobody is being tried. And of course, the sense of impunity is being fueled by this fact. And it affects us all. Something's rotten in the state of Malta, I hear you say. Yes, and such a beautiful island and such a great people, such a proud history. But uh, I must say that at the moment, indeed, the political uh, atmosphere is, is, is rotten. We repeatedly asked to speak with Prime Minister Muscat, but were told he didn't have time. Instead, the government put forward the finance minister, Edward Chikluna. The sheer volume, the circumstances, the fact patterns, can you not see how people looking at Malta from the outside really wonder about integrity and corruption here? Well, if they you know, want to know more about Malta, they'll find out that it's not that picture you, you're depicting. It looks bad, but it's not. Not the way it's been depicted. Definitely it, not. I want to be clear, this is a it depiction is. based on multiple different authorities all allegations. inside in Europe. They're all allegations. They're allegations that have come out of investigations. These aren't ad no, hominem no, attacks. No, not a, I, I'm not trying to downplay allegations. Allegations are serious, but they're still allegations. You know, it's up to the courts and the procedures and their experts to, de to decide. The supporters of Daphne Caruana Galizia have no faith in these experts and procedures, especially when it comes to solving her murder. After a high-profile government raid last year, three men were detained, figures she didn't know and never wrote about. But few doubt the assassination was ordered by one of her many powerful enemies. How will you know when you have justice? When all the corrupt people that she was reporting on treating our country as a gigantic trough which they're feeding from for years, when they've paid the price for that, then there will be justice for my mother's stories. But there also has to be justice for her murder too. The old ramparts designed to protect Malta from conquest and colonization still stand tall. But outside forces that once might have invaded the country now look on with concern, waiting to see whether Malta can confront itself and move in from the center of the fringes.